Hey everybody, so welcome to the next episode of the Knowledge Graph Technology Showcase Summer Edition. So today I am very excited because I have been dying to get Neo4j on the channel and today is our lucky day because they decided to come and join us, walking us through what is Neo4j, what is the big deal, why are so many people excited about it and honestly, I have started using Neo probably two or three years ago, and now I'm using it for things that are even on, uh, you know, in production in different companies. And I will have to say from my own experience, I've really enjoyed it. It does have a high learning curve, I will say, if you're not already an engineer or somebody that works in graph, but once you get over that hurdle, it really is an amazing tool. And there's a fantastic, community and a lot of free tools to help you get over that initial hurdle. And if you missed any of the other episodes or you want to catch any of the upcoming episodes in this series, make sure you click up above for the whole playlist. All right. So with that, let's go get started. And today I'm here with one of those fabulous people, and that is Dave. And Dave is going to be walking us through what is Neo4j. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Votel. I'm a senior sales engineer here at Neo4j. Uh, so let's get into it. Let's see what what's it all about. What's all the what's all the hype about? So as sort of like the de facto leader in the graph database space, we've been around for I want to say about ten years or so now. And so what I can share today are a couple of the highlights of the things that a lot of graph practitioners or graph curious folks can go grab and play with and get introduced to graph and especially graph use cases. That's great. Uh, what I'm sharing right now is called Neo4j Desktop. Mm -hmm. It's a product that's available for free for developers. It includes the enterprise edition of our product. Um, you can go and download it from neo4j.com slash download. And effectively, it's like a nice uh, database orchestration tool. So you can create a project, organize your experiments or what you're working on, uh, create one or many different database deployments, and it's all kind of point and click. You can even, mm -hmm. um, if I close my projects panel here, do one click installs of plugins mm. like our procedure library, okay. graph data science library, GraphQL add ons. And I know for some folks um, that follow your channel, especially in the knowledge graph space, uh, yeah. the Neo Semantics library that allows us to integrate natively with nice. RDFs and triple stores. There's a lot of really fun and exciting things that you want to spin up. And um, I've used Neo the most in those kind of applications where it's like, let's do something fun and shiny and cool and really dynamic. And not to say RDF can't also do those things, but I think Neo is just so native to those kind of use cases. The, the coolest thing I think about Neo is sort of being kind of the mature company in the space. We've got tooling for whomever you are and whatever role you play, mm -hmm. whether you're an independent application developer, we have things like Aura to get you started with a cloud-based Neo4j mm -hmm. as a service. And if you're more on the enterprise side, we've got tools for you if you're into data orchestration or and maybe on the business side, more into visualization. Mm -hmm. We've got things like Neo4j Bloom. Yeah. Uh, the ways people primarily interact with Neo4j, especially during kind of like the prototyping phase mm -hmm. uh, in active development, or either through Neo4j browser, which I've just pulled up here on my screen, which mm -hmm. allows folks to inspect a given graph schema and use Cypher, which is our query language, mm -hmm. in order to interrogate the graph, do analytics, um, try to find traversals and patterns throughout the structure. Yeah. And then things like Bloom allow the non-technical users, mm -hmm. those that don't want to know Cypher or don't learn it, to take more of a kind of a natural language approach to asking a question of the database and getting back a nice visualization. So in this particular system I've got prepared. So this is uh, one of my favorite demos. This is involving some uh, fictitious fraud data. I work mm -hmm. with a lot of banks in Toronto mm -hmm. mostly. Mm -hmm. um, in the fraud space, people will always wonder like, why do we always show fraud examples? It's like, well, <laughs> it's always very graphy. Yeah. Uh, it's tied to money. And money mm -hmm. is usually what's a good, you know, driver for a use case. Is are you going to be able to save money or um, decrease yeah. your losses or exposure or risk? Yeah, uh, finding of, bad actors, right? Like finding exactly. bad actors is is very much in the graph space. I almost I, I usually describe this as thinking of a web or or a network. You have the spider in the middle that kind of is like feeling out like when things are going awry, and that's essentially what graph is is doing um, for those use right. cases. So um, I'm not surprised that's a very powerful tool here. 
Yeah, and a lot of the the techniques we use in the fraud space are applicable outside. So that's sort of like what I like to do with my customer base is help them understand how to take techniques and tools from things like anti-money laundering, for instance, mm-hmm. and translate that into the world of even just like knowledge graph, for example, mm-hmm. or like a customer 360 yep. type of use case. And one of the common things that connects these is this idea of disambiguating who mm-hmm. your customer is, because usually we have incomplete information. And so like in this fraud demo, for instance, this is representing what's called a mobile money network. So if you think about like Venmo or Apple Pay, mm-hmm. predominantly people who are clients that are sending money back and forth between each other, maybe via SMS or via mm-hmm. the app. And when you create an account, like you usually have to, you have to put in like a tax ID. You yep. know, in the US, it's a social security number, mm-hmm. uh, things like email, phone number. And these are all identifiers. So these kind of purplish nodes here on the right represent these identifying characteristics that relate to this client account. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's ways you can quantify how similar clients are based off of matching identifiers. In the first party fraud world, um, unfortunately, we're usually very familiar with this use case because we'll get those emails saying, you know, there's been suspicious activity on your account? Did you log in from this IP address and all these things? And that's because identifying information has unfortunately leaked and people yeah. are trying to either use your information to create a new account. You know, we hear about identity theft, for instance, mm-hmm. um, or just impersonate you and try to maybe yeah. drain your credit line. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so and I, we- I think that um, when we, there's a lot of things going on right now in this space, talking about personal knowledge graphs as well, that kind of are tying a lot of these things together. So you can track better where your information is, who's using it, um, from a company's perspective. Right. Uh, but I do believe that as a person, right. So the medical space is using that a lot, but as a person, I might actually want to create my own personal knowledge graph to understand where is my bank account being used everywhere? Who does have my uh, social security number? You know, just so if something like that happens, I get a trigger, I can go in and understand where do I need to go and check? Where do I need to update my banking information once I, you know, get a new card because there's there's been an issue. So, you know, so far I've seen RDF used the most in that space, but I absolutely think that's going to be something that property graphs like Neo is going to really help with. Yeah, definitely. And I think that this is definitely stronger from a performance perspective when you need something quick and fast. Yeah, it it definitely has implications on like the query side. So from a application developer perspective, for instance, I just pulled up a Cypher query. The Cypher syntax is all what we call declarative. So the nice thing about Cypher, unlike some other graph query languages, you basically tell it the pattern you want. So we're here if we want to look for cases where we've got clients that have sharing identifying information, try to kind of find these like first party fraud rings. Um, Instead of having to express some sort of complex traversal logic and like basically write my own imperative program, I just tell the database what's the pattern I'm looking for. So here I'm looking for clients that has the has email, has phone, has SSN relationship, and I want that to repeat three to five times. And eventually I want to end on another client. I'm not telling the database how to do its job. I'm telling it what I want and expect of it. And I trust the database to, you know, be good at what it does, which is nice. And we're going to return, in this case, just these paths. So like a nice, technically, it could be a one-liner. Yeah. This is three because of a comment. We can find very quickly these kind of instances where we've got client accounts. In this case, Genesis, uh, Genesis Decker and Alyssa Knoll are sharing a phone number and an email, and it turns out this email is also shared by Allison Flynn. Now, this is all fictitious fabricated data, so. You're not leaving it all up to the machine, right? Like, so often, um, analysts understand, like, what smells funny, right? Like, they, you, they, it's hard for them to even put it into words when describing it to somebody else, but when you work with data, right, and, and, and you're really familiar with it, you kind of, like, get a feel for it. So right. if you know that in your data, if there's two people and they have the same uh, information that's fishy, right? So being able to really control that that pathway, I think, is really powerful for analysts specifically. Um, but when it comes to graph, we can use a lot, you know, more of a algorithmic approach. 
And the graph data science library is really kind of cool for doing that. So like yeah. if I wanted to do, like for instance, make a social network. Mm -hmm. So one of the cool things that you can do with pretty much any data involving customers or anybody performing activities between each other is to build a social network. So if yep. I send money to you, that sort of implies there's a connection between us. Mm -hmm. If you send money back to me, then we know that connection's maybe a bit stronger. Yeah. Um, and the way the Neo4j graph data science library works is you take what you already know with Cypher, you know, basic pattern matching. So in this case, let's say I want to find all my client nodes, so any node with a client label. Uh, but then we can also express the social network structure through the same type of traversal. So find me instances where a client performed a transaction, and that transaction went to another client. So not mm -hmm. to a merchant or to a bank, but instances where money moved, changed hands between people. Mm -hmm. And the GDS library leverages what you know as Cypher. We can create what's called a graph projection. And what we're doing here is basically doing this hybrid type of graph database approach where underlying um, under the covers is the native traditional transactional mm -hmm. database from Neo4j. Yep. Right now I'm creating an in-memory representation that's designed for analytics. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we can kind of jump back and forth between those two worlds. Yeah, uh, you can do so efficiently. So I just projected a half million nodes and 1.2 million relationships into memory in while we're chatting here. Yeah. So now I that mean, I got this thing called the projection, mm -hmm. I can start hitting it with algorithms and extracting out quantifiable information. Yeah, and I just want to pause there for a second because I, that is one of the biggest reasons people go with Neo is that speed. You just brought back a crazy amount of data. You traverse that graph and you got an answer, right? And, and it was in a blink of an eye, basically. Um, to be able to do that on anything else, um, I've done a lot of performance testing on graph databases and I have not found anyone faster than you yet. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's quite impressive. So this is a pretty large database too. This is I'm connected to a system I have. It's uh, 90 million nodes, 265 million relationships. Our architecture is designed to do what's called constant time traversal. Mm -hmm. So basically, what that means in layman's terms is we are designed such that if your database grows, your performance should stay the same. It should mm -hmm. be basically steady state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter if you have a million nodes or a billion nodes, the traversal yeah. rate will be constant. Uh, mm -hmm. And so things like GraphQL, where you're putting, you know, you're putting walls between the developer and the database, so they don't know, and they're not going to be able to tune their query to meet mm -hmm. the underlying storage mechanism way yeah. down in the depths of yeah. you know, the application, yeah. I mean, the, the database tier. Um, but now they have some faith and some trust that a query that was working today is going to work tomorrow, even though new data came in. In mm -hmm. Bloom, there's still Cypher that's involved. So mm -hmm. for instance, um, this, the query I was doing to show the schema, I'm running a stored mm -hmm. procedure, manipulating the results with Cypher. There's basically a kind of an integration point where you can create query templates, you can mm -hmm. do query parameters. So I can say, I want to allow my end user to plug in like a community ID or a product mm -hmm. ID name of something. Mm -hmm. and you can also blend in some full text search. Um, and ultimately it's running some Cypher. So mm -hmm. I don't need to know it. I just need to know the domain and I can explore the graph, you know, to my heart's content. It basically goes down two different paths. So there's the idea of using graph to visually explore the data. So in this case, I've run some analytics, built a community around part of the social network that we projected, for instance. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I can let the structure of the graph kind of express information about maybe mm -hmm. where I want to focus my attention and my research. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you know, this we can see very quickly just by zooming out just how expansive this community is. Mm -hmm. So in this case, each one of the, the yellow nodes is a client. Each one of the dark gray nodes is a transaction that occurred between them. Mm -hmm. So I can see, you know, there's a little isolation sort of on the sides and the fringe, mm -hmm. and there's some dense, densely packed clients in the middle. Mm -hmm. So visually, uh, if my use case is more kind of exploratory, just leveraging the graph natively like this is helpful. Yeah, and I think that that that's that's the the truth behind uh, most of the the data visualizations connected to graph is they are not normally uh, meant for end users. They are usually just a, a handy tool, right? Like what you just did you zoomed out to see kind of like where things were clustering together to to find meaning in it. Um, and you're you're doing some color coding. I mean, I, I color code right. everything. 
<laughs> when I'm doing um, any data visualizations. And it's not necessarily to say this entire graph is meaningful. It's to say, look at the entire graph and have your eye focus on the things that you really want to focus on. Um, so, you know, that's not, I, I would never yeah. give this to my end CEO. <laughs> it's the it's the classic kind of signal to noise thing. Um, you got to tread that little like very narrow tightrope of too much non-helpful information versus yeah. the right amount of information at the right time yeah. and to the right person. Yeah. So that's sort of where these these techniques really kind of let you as an application developer or somebody on the you know business analyst side mm -hmm. basically choose the right tool for the job, get the right information yeah. surfaced. One of the nice things about graph uh, is that it's effectively what we call the whiteboard model in which mm -hmm. if, hypothetically you're sitting down with somebody trying to visualize the problem you're discussing. So like let's say we're talking about clients and clients have phone numbers. You know, this we don't have to talk about ER diagrams. We don't have to talk about schema, mm -hmm. uh, second, third, normal form, those types of things. We can focus yeah. on modeling the real world yeah. that everybody's a part of. We can use yeah. the vocabulary that everybody understands. It could be native to the business, yep. but it's at least a shared vocabulary internally, which, yeah. you know, that's why knowledge and, graphs are graphs, because it's you know, yeah. connecting vocabularies between different disparate parties or disparate data sets. And that's that's sort of what graph lets us do. Yeah. And on the delivery side, graph can still be very powerful because you know we're not looking at a table of numbers here. It's not okay, yeah. what does this mean? I mean, yes, technically there's a little bit of what does this represent? Yeah. But human beings are just naturally pattern matching visual yep. people. I mean, that's yep. what we do. And so you can usually say just by looking at something, something looks weird or out of place. Or different than something else. Yeah, yeah, and you know that that's something that I think is is really powerful, and why so many people use Neo, other than you've been around more than uh, you know ever everyone else, and you do have that that open tier. It's also um, property graphs in general. It's easier to take that whiteboarding and and just make a node and an edge and connect it and see what else connects to it without having to worry is it an instance is it a class is you know and right. i think because of that it makes this more accessible to experimentation because there isn't such a high threshold of knowledge that you have to have to get started um so anytime i'm working with with anyone that's starting into graph i do actually tell them you know start with this whiteboarding and start with um more of a property graph like model because you shouldn't have to worry what a class is. You shouldn't have to worry about, you know, the the in-depth semantics if you're just starting out, especially when you don't know if graph is right for you. Exactly. <clears throat> and then one of the nice things about this Arrows app is that after you do your little whiteboard, if you want to create some sample data that you just stick into Neo4j browser, mm -hmm. so you have another way to, you know, kick the tires on it, maybe write some experiments. Yeah. Yeah, is Arrows part of the, the Neo4j like suite or is it just a partner of yours? Yeah. So we have the Neo4j Labs um, mm -hmm. environments. Neo4j Labs contains a bunch of different tools that uh, that basically solve little niche needs. Mm -hmm. So things like Arrows is good for modeling. Uh, mm -hmm. So they don't come necessarily bundled with a product, but they're mm -hmm. freely available. They're mm -hmm. open source. They're built and maintained by basically the community and our own engineers. Mm -hmm. Really cool. Nice. That's yeah, where some things I, like you know for Jay, um, the Neo semantic support has come through yeah. that way. Yeah. Even graph data science, that library started as the graph algorithms library years ago. It's it's quite it's quite amazing to just see like the the breadth of the adoption. Like we have yeah. thousands of certified professionals through the mm -hmm. Graph Academy. And mm -hmm. then even like on the graph data science side, that's all open source as well. And mm -hmm. we've even started receiving contributions of folks implementing algorithms themselves right. that wanted to right. share. Yeah, it's definitely a very robust community, which is fabulous, especially again, when somebody's starting out, I mean, you really want people to um, shoot ideas off to and, and kind of ask um, where to go. Is there any um, project or like end user kind of project um, interface that you can show us that's using Neo behind the scenes. And so those familiar with the Panama Papers, for instance. So I believe this is entirely powered by 
Neo4j behind the scenes here, and I believe they're using Lincurious on top at some point. Here we go. We're going to expand a lot of connections. Let's see what happens. Here we go. Okay. Very cool. So you can expand out and follow the connections between, in this case, this particular organization has a bunch of different intermediaries. Mm -hmm. hmm. Registered and in British Virgin Islands. Yeah, not so. This this uh, is is a really cool approach to uncovering insights that you'd never be able to find, and being able to put something meaningful on top of it for people to be able to discover it, which is amazing. Yeah, and we already have this in our sandbox environment. So mm. for folks oh, cool. who want to poke around with things like the Panama Papers, yeah, uh, we've got. I think I already loaded it here. There we go. Yeah, we have the Paradise Papers in this case, cool. which I believe. Oh, so you can go and explore. Oh, that's nice so that people can see the back end and then the front end that you showed us. Love it. Perfect. All right, so as we're waiting for this to load up, Dave, if anyone is interested in getting a hold of you or finding out more about all of the great stuff that you just showed us, how would you recommend they get in touch with you? Um, you can always email me, dave.votala at neo4j.com. Um, I do have a blog as well that is, nice. uh, I haven't touched it in a little while, but the last mm -hmm. couple of posts are all about Neo4j related topics. So cool. when we were premiering our graph embeddings, I did a nice mm -hmm. little write up about basically how to use Node to Vec and the Les Mis data to create yeah. a um, social network and analyze <laughs> so the funny. Yeah, that's fun. That's like, um, I think the Game of Thrones network is also Neo based. Uh, <laughs> there's a few of them out there like yep. that. Um, and my favorite, I just saw K-Means clustering. As everybody on this channel probably knows by now, I'm a sucker for anything K-Means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, so my example weird. here is also nice for folks that um, are used to doing it with things like scikit-learn and Python. Yeah. Because uh, what I do is I run the embeddings in Neo, uh, show you how to take those vectors out, run it through kind of a third-party ML framework if you want, and then put it back into Neo to visualize with Bloom. Really fun. And I, I, I kind of reproduce it. what's in the paper from the node to vec um, paper itself. So kind of an educational exercise too for folks not familiar with embeddings and what they mean in graph structure. Absolutely, and I think that's that's a really great point is node embeddings are um, sometimes like confusing to people that aren't familiar with what they are actually used for. And I think this gives you, okay, let's set it up, let's do the sandbox, let's let's run the embeddings and actually do something with it. I, I, I think that's really helpful for, for those that, that wanna go and experiment.